Psalm 122, 6 reminds us that we're to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, we are told that those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And uh, we want to be a blessing. We want to stand with them. There's not a lot you and I can do. And I'm too old and too fat to go sign up for the army of Israel, but uh, I can pray for them. And you can pray for them, and we certainly trust you will. We also want to be praying uh, for Nancy Ferguson and Sherry Wingfield. Uh, Nancy's daughter uh, went to be with the Lord yesterday. We've been praying for Joe Ellen, and she uh, she did pass yesterday. And uh, that is uh, Nancy's daughter and is Sherry Wingfield's uh, aunt. So it really touches touches home here. I want you to be praying for uh, Samantha um, the last name on that? Smith. Smith, Smith okay. Um, her husband, uh, how, old, how old was he? 33. 33. Uh, dear friend of the family, her son's best friend committed suicide this week. And uh, he's 33 years old. He had to leave behind four children. And uh, their hearts are broken, lots of questions. And that we can well imagine. So please be in prayer for uh, the Smith family, especially Samantha Smith. And be praying for Sally. This is like losing a son for her if you'd be praying. Continue to be praying for Vicki Womack. She's got a couple more days of chemo before she starts the sim still. And uh, Leland Tuttle is here this morning. He and Joni has been diagnosed with skin cancer. And he needs to see a radiologist tomorrow for treatment options. And uh, Bruce Cook, Bruce uh, uh, had a mild heart attack this past Monday, but he's doing well. Pray for Bonnie Boyd. She has ongoing uh, procedures. Um, Ken and Sue's daughter, Cindy, MRI today at UVA. We'll see the surgeon on uh, Tuesday for the reoccurring uh, cancer. Martha uh, Shannonberger uh, being tested for blood clots. Larry Shannonberger, surgery on his hand. Debbie Campbell's been diagnosed with Lyme disease, and uh, you be praying for Debbie. She's out there working the, uh, the coffee section. Please, if you would, be praying. Frida, it's good to have you back, and uh, she has been uh, very, very sick, and uh, she's back with Buck, and uh, Buck has got some uh, ongoing back problems. And Kara Cook, Frida's daughter, and the loss of their baby. Uh, be praying there. And then April Carter, Phyllis's daughter, had surgery for kidney stones. And uh, a lot of different prayer requests. We, we, a lot of praises, too. Uh, Gates and Cleland Berry moved to assisted living facility, and they're very happy there. And their address is in the bulletin. Please send them a card. Please encourage them. Greg Kreitz, a good report. He is at home. He's very tired. And he has finished the infusions for stem cell. So we want to just keep praying for him. How many others have an unspoken prayer request this morning that you would on? And uh, some of you I know mentioned to me too. One of the things you can do to help me is that if you have a prayer request, write it down for me. Um, uh, at my age, if you don't write it down, uh, it never happened. And uh, not a court in the world. Norman, if you, are you agreeing with that? <laughs> I, I do get it. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I want to introduce our speaker for this day. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your love right back at us in a greater way than we could ever imagine. Father, undeserved. Father, your mercy is so real. Your patience with us. Your grace is magnificent. And we just want to say we love you and we praise you today. And uh, Father, we, we need you in our midst. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do what we cannot do. Not the best speaker in the world could do it. Not the most beautiful music could set the, set the stage. But Father, the Holy Spirit himself would move in our hearts, Father. And there's something here for each of us this day. Father, for so many of the prayer requests, whether it's bereavement, whether it's cancer treatments, whether it is uh, ongoing uh, procedures, whether it's the unknown, whether it is uh, unspoken prayer request. You know the need of every heart here today. I pray, Father, you would just bless in a very special way. Bless Brother Oliver. We're grateful for him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to ask that you show that video, if you would, just a short video, 
uh, I didn't on, write my story. God wrote my story. About Oliver and, and his story. It wasn't a good start. We had moved into a trailer, and the trailer had burned down. So we decided to move into a tool shed. Didn't have any electricity, no running water. We were going to be there for maybe six months, but six months turned into six years. And I still remember we're standing outside, and there's a little lamp light there. You could just see from my parents' face that something horrible had happened. I mean, they were just contorted, so much pain and grief. It was the you know, worst day of my life. My sister was killed in a car accident. She was going to be nine years old in 10 days. Just like, how could that be? What happened? But through that, God sustained our family. That's what Invincible Joy does. This is an overcoming joy. We're going to have trials, temptations, problems, pain, challenges, struggles. But you can, you can have joy in spite of all of that. No matter where you've started, you can end well. You would think that Oliver's book would have been in Invincible Sorrow, but it's Invincible Joy. And he's going to tell story. his story God this morning, story. and uh, he's going to tell his story this morning and about the ministry. And uh, let me just give you a brief introduction. In 1988, Oliver and his lovely wife, Andrea, graduated from the University of Virginia, where he had also played football, by the way. They got married. They moved to the Dominican Republic as missionaries all in the space of three months. It's a lot going on. Their life together with Jesus and their five children has been blessed, uh, uh, which has continued to be an adventure. In 1995, Oliver uh, completed his master's degree in civil engineering at UVA. In 1996, the Lord called Oliver to advancing Native missions after he had worked for five years as an environmental engineer. Uh, the president of Advancing Native Missions, Oliver, has a passion to build teams, encourage and love the staff members, and equip uh, and encourage uh, and advocate for the Native missionaries to reach the remaining unreached people groups of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. And I say all that to say he is a dear, dear friend of mine. I had the privilege of serving for about 18 years with Brother Oliver there at Advancing Native Missions. And what you hear today is, 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 is real, it's genuine, it's tested. And we've asked him to come on this second Sunday of our uh, missions conference with the theme of Break Our Hearts. So Brother Oliver, if you will come and if our folks will give Brother Oliver a great welcome. Thank you, Dr. Reichard. Oh, you, you mean he doesn't make y'all call him Dr. Reichard? <laughs> he makes us call him Dr. Reichard. Just totally kidding, totally kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Dan, Pastor Dan. It's so good to be with you, brother. And uh, yeah, Dan is, is like a, a brother from another mother uh, to me. Just love him uh, immensely. Just a man of tremendous wisdom and grace and um, so, and he's, he's not paying me to say any of these nice things. So, so I want to just, uh, like, as, um, as my brother uh, uh, introduced me, so my name is Oliver Asher. I'm president of Advancing Native Missions. And uh, so you saw some of my story up here, and that's what I'm going to do this morning, is just share some of my story. <clears throat> just to give you a couple of uh, life theme verses, though. Uh, first of all, uh, one of my life theme verses is uh, 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul tells Timothy, the genuine faith I see in you, I saw first in your grandmother Eunice and your mother uh, Lois. And so I also owe my faith uh, to my grandmother Lily, uh, who shared the good news of Jesus with my mom Carol, and then my mom Carol, who shared it with me and my brother and my sister uh, when we were children. And so at about seven years old, I made that decision to follow Jesus. Uh, but let me go backwards just a little bit. Uh, so I was uh, born to a 17-year-old mom in uh, the projects of uh, Tampa, Florida. And at the time, my dad was in prison. Uh, but he decided in order to see his son, he would escape. So he was uh, in prison in uh, southern Florida. Uh, we were living in Tampa. And if you know anything about the geography of Florida, uh, there's something in between. Do you know what that is? The Everglades. The Everglades. That's right. 
So he escaped uh, literally off the chain gang. They, the, the guard shot, tried to kill him, uh, was not successful. He ran through the Everglades a couple of days. He said that was actually a good thing because he lost, the dogs lost his scent and uh, ended up coming to Tampa and hung out at a, evidently a dairy farm outside of Tampa uh, for a couple of months. And then uh, they found him. A uh, SWAT team came, broke open all the doors and windows, took him back to prison uh, where he was there in a four by eight dark cell for another two years. Considered uh, uh, a very dangerous criminal uh, because of his escape. So that was kind of the beginning of life. So once he uh, was out of prison, though, uh, my mom and dad decided to move to southwestern Virginia. That's where my dad's family's from. And so we moved to uh, near a little town called Damascus. Uh, yeah, I was I was saved on the road to Damascus. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so we moved to this little town, actually 10 miles outside of a little town of 500. So we're really out in the country. As a matter of fact, when people say, how do you get to your house? I say, well, just follow the hard uh, pavement until, uh, you know, it ends in the, in, the, in the gravel road and then follow the gravel road to the end. And that's where we live. And so uh, that was that was where we lived. Moved to a little uh, a holler uh, called Rush Creek. And, uh, you know, and it's funny when I share my testimony sometimes, especially with people, you know, not in the South, they don't really know what a holler is. So, but, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm in good company, right? Y'all know what a holler is, right? Basically two mountains, right? And, you know, a road or stream in between, usually both. And, uh, sun, sun comes up about 11 a.m., goes down about 3 p.m. And that's kind of how it <laughs> was for us, uh, living in the holler. And it was, uh, Damascus is about 11 to 12 miles from the Tennessee line. So really about as far, Southwest as you can get. Some people think Virginia ends at Roanoke, but it goes down quite a bit further. <laughs> so anyway, so I was about five years old when we moved up. And um, yeah, so uh, we, 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 we uh, moved into a little trailer on the side of a mountain and just was kind of living the you know country life there. Again, my parents weren't saved. My dad had grown up with the gospel, so he knew the gospel, but he had chosen a different life. And so, uh, but we were living in this little trailer and then, uh, that, like I said, when I was about seven years old, uh, my grandma Lily shared the good news of Jesus with my mom, Carol, <clears throat> you know, and then my mom Carol shared it with me and my brother and sister, you know what? And at seven years old, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed a savior. So when I heard about the savior that left heaven, came down to earth, was born of the Virgin Mary, you know, lived a sinless life, uh, died a horrible death on the cross, became sin for me so that I could become the righteousness of God and uh, laid in a tomb for three days and rose again on the third day. When I heard that story, I believed. Brother Dan, it was just, uh, I, I knew I'd already sinned. You know, I'd beat up my brother probably, you know, once or twice. I'd, you know, said some curse words, uh, you know, actually... I uh, stole a pack of pencils from the local Piggly Wiggly. And, uh, you know, I was five years old and, and uh, getting ready for the first day of school. And uh, my mom, she knows I had a pack of pencils. She, she didn't remember buying them. She said, where did you get those pencils? And I was like, uh, of course, not a good liar, you know, at five years old. Uh, still not good. But, <laughs> so, but I told her I'd stolen them. And so she took me back to the Piggly Wiggly and had to apologize to the man or give her those pencils, you know, and say, I'm sorry for stealing your pencils. So anyway, so, so, so early on, and again, had a, you know, uh, a godly mom that uh, did, uh, you know, was the person most like Jesus, even until today uh, that I know. So we're living in this little trailer on the side of a mountain. And basically what happened when I was 12 years old really changed uh, the course of my life and our lives is our trailer burned down. Hey, Shelly, it's good to see you. <laughs> And our, uh, our trailer burned down, and uh, so everything that we had uh, uh, burned up. And uh, I remember being in, I went to a local high school called Holston High School. It was 7 through 12, about 400 kids. Again, this is, you know, small. It's, we're, we're out in rural countryside in, in Washington County, Virginia. And a principal called me down to the office, so the vice principal did, said, hey, you know, sorry to give you bad news. Your house burned down, but your mom's okay. And that was the most important thing. My mom was the only one at home, but uh, she got out, and, and so it was okay. Uh, but I remember coming home that day and just going around that last bend in the road, you know, and just seeing the charred remains of what used to be our home. And, uh, you know, and it was, it was kind of, it was kind of sad. Uh, but anyway, so we moved in, I think with my grandparents, probably for a couple of weeks, they lived just up the road from us. And, uh, but then, uh, we decided to move into, uh, uh, tool shed and literally, I mean, it was, it was a shed where we kept our tools. I mean, not that we had that many tools, but we kept tools in there. And it probably honestly was about, probably not quite as big as this stage. 
And uh, so we, uh, yeah, and the only electricity I had was one light bulb in the middle of the room. Uh, didn't have indoor uh, plumbing, water, anything like that. Had an outhouse on the hill. There was a, uh, a not a well, but um, like a, what do you call it, a spring about a mile up the road. And, and so we kind of, we ran literally gravity fed water uh, to our house. And eventually we, at least we had, you know, cold water in the house. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so we decided to move into that little, uh, tool shed, uh, for six months, you know, until we could save up, get a down payment and maybe on another trailer, uh, six months turned into six years. And so you can imagine, you know, as a 12 year old, uh, you know, 13, 14, up to 18, I mean, uh, you know, was, was, uh, wasn't the best social life, certainly, you know, for a teenager. And, uh, but, uh, it was, it was hard on the family. I mean, we obviously, you know, this is a, the mid 1980s. So it's not like, you know, the 1920s when you may have expected more of that. Um, but, um, so we were, yeah, so we were, we were going to, uh, you know, uh, save up and buy a trailer. Didn't, I mean, buy another trailer. It didn't happen. And so that first winter though, I remember because this, this, uh, uh, this, um, tool shed was made basically out of scrap lumber. So if you know anything about scrap lumber, basically, you know, that it doesn't fit well together so you had cracks in it that first winter was really cold we had a had a heater a a wood stove that we had that heated up the house and my mom cooked on a on a wood stove so basically a wood cook stove so that was our only heat and that first winter like I said was real cold uh literally like uh we basically just partitioned it into four rooms a kitchen a living room myself and my brother were in one room then my mom dad and sister in the other room and that first winter I remember if it was 32 outside it was 32 in our room you know thank god for a good mama right that would get up and you know and put a uh, make a fire and, and dad as well make a fire and you know and cook us breakfast and get us going on the day but uh so yeah so that was life in this trailer uh my coaches at uh, the high school would actually let me in the winter time take uh hot showers uh at the school <clears throat> so that was again just you know there was a, fortunately the good thing about living in the holler is always fresh clean water you know so we had a nice creek that ran by the house and so we washed everything in that creek you know or you know our clothes our, our dishes, our, our bodies, our, you know, whatever we need to wash, we pretty much wash it in the creek. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so that was life. And then, the, but the worst thing that really happened, as you saw in the video, is uh, my sister, who was almost nine, uh, also died in a car accident during that time. So that was, I was 16 at the time, kind of in the middle of that. And just, yeah, just a dark, dark day. You know, she was like sunshine, you know, just like springtime, resurrection time. And, and so, <clears throat> you know, God decided to take her early, just uh, was a car accident. Uh, my mom and dad were driving and literally a door opened and she fell out and that was it. And they were only, they were going about 25 miles per hour. So it was kind of weird. I mean, I've jumped, jumped off of trucks going, you know, faster than that, but uh, yeah, but God decided to take her home. <clears throat> so again, was 16 at that time. So again, there were some dark times, some hard times, but you know what? It really, it was okay because we had Jesus in our hearts. You know, we knew, we knew Jesus. We knew the creator of the universe. Uh, we knew the savior of the world. And so he kept us and he brought us through that. My dad actually was saved right before she died. So I'm sure that's what kept him from going insane uh, because she was the, the one daughter, the youngest daughter, kind of apple of his eye. And, um, you know, so, but again, we had to accept that God wanted her in his choir <clears throat> earlier than the rest of us. <clears throat> Excuse me, but what did happen during that time? My dad uh, was an iron worker. He would work uh, mostly in the coal fields, uh, you know, putting together big uh, conveyor belts and all kinds of different, uh, you know, machinery. And and so, uh, but when he wasn't doing that, he was cutting wood. And so in the winter time, we would cut wood, uh, you know, load it in a truck, literally take it to town to sell it. And then in the summertime, we would log. And so, you know, a little bit different to cut the logs up, put them on a truck, take them to the mill. So my first football workouts were with a, with a, uh, still chainsaw, right? Going up and down the mountains, up and down the mountains with still chainsaw. We had a system. My dad would cut the tree down. Uh, I'd cut it up. My brother would trim it. And I asked him one time, Hey, what was the most we ever did on a, you know, on a Saturday? Cause of course, you know, every day after school until dark, you know, it was cutting wood. Uh, Saturdays was cutting wood. Usually we didn't have to do anything on Sundays, but, uh, one Saturday he said, yeah, probably, uh, 27 loads. You know, and so I thought, you know, for me and my dad and brother, you know, cut that much, that was, that was pretty good. And then after we got 
it out of the woods, though, we'd have to, my brother and I would have to split it with a 10 pound mall. So again, that's, that, those were my first workouts. And, and, and I thank God for that, you know, that uh, I was able to, to go through that. And he had that planned uh, for my life, for the future of my life. And you know what? And it prepared me for missionary life. So I'm especially thankful for that. Uh, but what happened is, uh, so I went to, like I told you, the local high school, Holston High School. Uh, the, the problem was we were terrible at football. We'd had like four, four winning seasons in 20 years. And uh, my eighth grade year, we lost to our rivals 91-0. to zero. I, right? I know. Yeah, me too. That, that was my reaction. Oh, my goodness. What in the world? Even as an eighth grader, I was like, oh. Uh, but <laughs> thank God, uh, by my senior year, we won the district championship. You know, what's, what's crazy, that same team, uh, Chill Howie, they were a crosstown rivals. Uh, they beat a seven to six. But we'd made a lot of improvements. So from 91-0 to 7-6, but still didn't beat them, uh, you know, any of my four years there. But we did, uh, we won enough district games to, to go to the playoffs. And so that really uh, put me on the roadmap in terms of being recruited. And, 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 and all glory to God. Again, brothers and sisters, right, our testimonies, our stories, right, we can't own them, right? We, we just have to give God the glory because everything we have comes from him, right? And so, I, again, I just give him the glory. But I honestly, too, I had a great, awesome Christian coach who moved in our junior year he brought the fellowship of christian athletes to our school uh, i became a big part of that he was like a father and a mentor to me and so uh he obviously was a good coach <clears throat> led our team to a district championship won the first round you know went against the team 10 and 0 and everybody was shocked that we did that uh went ended up uh going to the to the region finals got beaten out by perry mcclure how, how many of you probably heard of perry mcclure that right they were a powerhouse in the 80s i don't know if they're still a powerhouse but back then they were i think that's about their third state championship but um, what happened, though, is uh, so Coach uh, really was really awesome in getting film out. And so he had sent film to different schools, mostly in Virginia. Uh, but I I'd, I'd visited like Tennessee, Wake Forest, um, Univer- uh, Virginia Tech. Um, University of Richmond, and uh, but he said, hey, uh, there's this university called the University of Virginia. They offered you a scholarship. And I said, you mean Virginia Tech? <laughs> I live so far down in southwest Virginia, I didn't know there was a University of Virginia. So I'm sure some of you are happy to, to know that, right? Biff, I know you're happy to know that. I'm sorry, man. You know, some of you, I think, when they said I graduated from UVA, you know, kind of turned it off. But, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, I didn't know either. I was like, what? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm interested, obviously, you know. Uh, neither of my parents graduated from high school. So to, you know, go on to college was a huge dream uh, that, you know, only the Lord could fulfill. And so praise the Lord, uh, they offered and I accepted. <clears throat> and so ended up coming to Charlottesville. That's how I ended up in Charlottesville. And you can imagine, uh, you know, going from a woodshed to a first year dorm at UVA. That, that was kind of culture shock. And, uh, but, but in a good way, right? I mean, electricity, hot water, you know, 24 hour, you know, uh, food, uh, you know, I mean, just, you know, everything we needed. Um, and, but that was again, God's grace and blessing on my life. And uh, I will tell you, though, that the coaches, when they came down and they came to Rush Creek Holler and <clears throat> visit my home, <clears throat> they were pretty shocked. Their, their eyes were about as big as saucers. These, again, are, you know, two coaches from Charlottesville. They'd never been down, I don't think, in the hollers anyway. But uh, so they came down and, and were just shocked to kind of, you know, see our living conditions. But you know what? God had a plan. <clears throat> and so he brought me to UVA. The best thing that happened to me, though, was not football. Uh, as a matter of fact, during that time, I realized, hey, everybody hangs up the cleats at some point, right? Whether it's, you know, in college or, you know, pros or whatever. And, and I did have a dream. I wanted to play professional football, you know, wanted to especially make it up to my mom, who's been such an angel and, you know, buy her that, that house on a hill. And, you know, if there's money left over, buy me that, you know, candy apple uh, red Corvette, you know, but uh, yeah, but that didn't work out. That wasn't God's plan. So the best thing that happened to me was I met my wife, Andrea. <clears throat> What's kind of funny is uh, she grew up in uh, Upper East Side, uh, Manhattan. So uh, New York City. Yeah. So kind of different, uh, different cultures. Uh, she came down. She's like, where are the people? <laughs> And, and what are those, what's that loud noise at night? And I'm like, you mean the crickets? So, <laughs> so yeah, so we met, fell in love and uh, got married right afterwards. As Dan said in my bio, I moved to the Dominican Republic for a year because when we were involved in missions, we, the only way we knew to be involved was to go somewhere. Right. And, uh, but now I've learned there are other ways to be involved. But uh, so we went there. <laughs> We served there for a year and just really, again, out of, you know, Thanksgiving in our hearts, you know, that God had been so good to us and we just wanted to give something back to him. So we were down there. We helped build a church, helped.
help build an orphanage. Uh, came back to Charlottesville. She was pregnant with her oldest son, Alex. We have five kids. Uh, the oldest is Alexander. <clears throat> and uh, so we decided to settle down in Charlottesville. And at that time, we could have lived in, you know, Southwest Virginia, New York, Charlottesville. Even my wife is first, intergr- first generation Hungarian-American. Uh, thought about maybe planning a church in Hungary. Uh, but that didn't work out. We wrote letters to her family even and tried to get go there. Didn't work out. So I just began then to work as an engineer. Uh, that was my background in undergrad was environmental science. So I was actually on the science side of uh, engineering. And then later on, went back to UVA, got my master's in uh, civil engineering with an emphasis in environmental engineering. And again, because I was on the, inv- the engineering track and, you know, we had tried to get into ministry after we came back from the DR. Uh, nothing really opened up until I was on this track. I'd already had my master's in engineering and I had a dream that I was laid off from my job. And then two days later, I was laid off from my job. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, Lord, I, you know, I hear you, you know, you're talking to me, obviously. And, um, you know, what do you want? And, um, you know, what do you want me to do? And so the Lord, uh, he, he opened up the door for me to come to Advancing Native Missions. At the time, I was going to a local church and knew a brother named Bo Barreto, who was a co-founder, him and his wife, Marlou, of Advancing Native Missions. They had four beautiful children. I knew he was in missions. I knew he traveled a lot. We, we were in Sunday school together, but I didn't know much more than that. And so, uh, but, so he invited me when he found out I was in transition. Hey, why don't you come by uh, A&M, you know, and see what we do? And so I said, sure, you know, I'll come by. So I went by AM and m uh, and number one uh, thing that I fell in love with was the vision, Matthew 24, 14, when the glorious gospel of the kingdom has been preached throughout the geographic world as a witness to all nations, people, groups, ethnos, then the end will come, right? Jesus comes back and rules and wanes. Wow, what a vision. But then the, it was a mission that really attracted me, Dan, I think probably maybe for you too, brother, you know, and probably for most of us at AM and uh, was the way that they uh, accomplished the vision was through uh, encouraging equipping and advocating for indigenous missionaries that were fruitful, strategic, and reaching the least reached and unreached in the, all the nations of the earth. And again, I was like, wow, what a, what a great idea. And, you know, so I could see that Andre and I, God had closed the door and going to Hungary or seminary and some other opportunities, but he had opened the door for us to multiply ourselves uh, through A&M. And so, so we prayed hard. And then the other, the third, um, the third thing that really attracted me to A&M was just the grace and the love that they had for each other as they worked together. You know, is that, uh, you know, we can accomplish a, a vision and mission, but you know what, if we don't love each other while we're doing it, it's not worth very much, right? And uh, the world will know that we're his children by our love for each other. So that was 1996. So Audrey and I prayed, uh, said, Lord, if, you know, if this is a path, open up the door. My, my main concern was at that point, so we're 30 years old. You know, really it was a, you know, it was a fork in the road and, uh, we were, had been happily married for about eight years. We had four kids by that time. And, uh, you know, and, and we had a, uh, my wife was a stay at home mom, uh, kids like to eat, you know? And so I was like, okay, Lord, you know, my first ministry is to provide for my family. And Dan knows my kids are big. And so they like to eat a lot, right, Dan? <laughs> and so, uh, but we prayed and, and really had to have a sense of peace that, you know, this wasn't just us wanting to go this direction, but this was God's will for our lives. And so uh, he really, he made it very clear. He, he really gave us just a, a very powerful word that this is the path that he's chosen uh, for us, uh, you know, walk down it, you know, I'll provide for your family your children. And, uh, and so that was all I needed. So I literally, that was Sunday night, Monday morning, uh, went to, that was after an altar service and just praying at the altar. <clears throat> so Monday morning went in and resigned my job from my engineering firm said, Hey, I'm, I know what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life. And so two weeks later I was at advancing native missions. And at the time we're about seven people. And, uh, so praise God by his mercy and grace. We've grown to about 60 people. We're located in Afton, Virginia, just, uh, West of Charlottesville. And again, from there, we continue to, you know, implement the vision and the mission that God gave brother Bo and uh, another brother Carl, uh, uh, 20, uh, 30, actually 31 years ago. And so, so when we, uh, we joined, it was a total step of faith. Uh, but I can tell you that again, because, you know, I mean, professional engineer, right. And then uh, missionary, And, you know, whatever that means, raise your own support, you know, (laughs) brother Dan and Shelly, y'all have been there. Maybe some of y'all have been there as well, Uh, but it was a life of faith. But I can tell you today that all five of her her children, they love the Lord. You know, and that was one of my concerns. They're going to hate God and hate dad, you know, for starving them. Uh, But God provided for all of them. They love the Lord. They all had great education. They all have married. All five of them are married. Uh, Two of them have uh, uh, little ones. So we have four grandchildren. And again, all glory and honor to God. Amen. I mean, we 
we, right? I mean, I didn't write my story. Like I said in the video, you know, God, God wrote my story just like he's written yours. Um, so yeah, so I just want to take a few minutes and talk about, uh, advancing native missions then. So going back to the vision and mission of, of A&M and just like, uh, like I said, I mean, my wife and I, we were intrigued by the vision and the mission. And, um, you know, that's that's what we've been working on since then. And so from this couple, uh, this Filipino couple, we've grown uh, to where we are now in 121 countries, uh, supporting about 27,000 Native missionaries that are engaging about 1,000 unreached people groups. How many of y'all know the term unreached people groups or people groups? Okay. Yeah. A lot of you, I figured you would. Okay. Um, yeah. So again, when, you know, when the Bible talks about people groups, nations, it's really, it's talking about, you know, individual people groups with a, with a particular uh, language and culture and customs. And so that's a, you know, that was a nation. It wasn't like the geopolitical nations. Like for instance, when you think about India, right? So India, we think about India as a nation, 1.5 billion people, right? Lots of religions, lots of languages, but actually in probably about a third of the sides of the U S but actually they are, uh, they have approximately 2,500 at least people groups within India, a distinct, you know, uh, people, uh, groups with their own language and culture, et cetera. And so they are, um, you know, so there are 2,500 of them and probably about 2,000 ish are not reached with the gospel. Now, many of them probably have been engaged. Praise the Lord. That means, and to be reached with the gospel means that they have a population of 2% Christianity and above. And, and again, this is kind of in mission circles. You know, we talk about this, but just so you know, when I talk about, you know, if it's unreached, that means they have a population of less than 2% Christian. If it's reached, they have a population of more than 2%. Because, um, again, yeah, uh, church, uh, experts uh, feel like that, you know, once it takes about 2% of the population for the church to really be able to kind of sustain itself, you know, multiply, sustain itself and be able to, you know, become a church making uh, body. And so that's why we talk about, again, people un unreached and, and reach people groups. Now I'm going to talk about more of that in my message today. So I won't go too far there. Uh, but just to let you know, again, that that's our passion, you know, is, is reaching these. And we've been blessed, you know, with having, um, you know, Pastor Dan, as our uh, East Asia um, uh, regional director for th all these years. And, and just again, you know, what God has, has done, and that would be China, Mongolia, Japan, uh, North and South Korea. And again, obviously huge work going on there, right? And, uh, you know, God is doing amazing things there. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk about that more uh, in a little while. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm thank the Lord for, for Dan and just leading us in our endeavors in that part of the world. And we're seeing the Lord certainly work in Mongolia. Uh, we're seeing the Lord work in uh, North Korea, uh, certainly South Korea, obviously. And then we're trying to trying to get into Japan. Haven't been able to, but uh, brother, there's, yeah, we're really close. There are a couple of potentials there for us. So, so again, so that, that's who we are at A&M. You know, that's our passion. That's our vision is to just uh, to see the gospel uh, preached to the ends of the earth. Because you think about this, 2,000 years ago, right? Jesus gave the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? The Great Commission is the command to go, right, and make disciples in all nations. And brothers and sisters, 2,000 years later, it still hasn't happened. So we believe, again, in our day, in our time, uh, that God uh, God is, is going to make that happen. And again, it's up to him. It's in his sovereignty, right? But at the same time, he, in his sovereignty, allows us to participate through praying, through giving, through going. And so, um, so we're excited about the future. We're excited about Jesus coming back soon. And of course, this morning, like, you know, uh, Pastor Dan said, you know, we're praying for Israel, right? That's been attacked, right? And uh, we, you know, believe, most experts believe Iran's behind that. We know Iran is a part of what I call the evil axis, Iran and, and China and uh, Russia, right, are, are moving together. And, and there, we know from the, from the scriptures, right, there's, that they are, they're players in the end time, right? And so we may, who knows, you know, the, as the Abraham Accord, is that the final, uh, you know, safety that uh, the scriptures talk about? Uh, when, you know, when the Lord is going to come and intervene, uh, we don't know exactly, but uh, certainly uh, we know we're closer today than we've ever been right to his coming and we need to be ready. We need to get ready. And so again, I don't want to go too much in there because I'm going to preach on that in a little while, but um, I just want to probably maybe at this point open up uh, to some questions and answers. I think we may have about 10 minutes. Dan. Yeah.
Yes. Amen. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, honestly, so when Andre and I were called into ministry, so obviously I was an engineer professional. Uh, Andre actually went back to school, ended up getting her nursing degree. She actually is an RN now, uh, OB, loves helping moms have babies. But, you know, we, so God, we had this burning desire to be in ministry. You know, it's like, man, I just, you know, need to, we need to be in ministry. But then uh, it, it seemed like none of the doors were opening. So it's like, Lord, we have this burning desire to be in ministry. We've been on the field. You know, we, 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 we want to serve you. Uh, so I just, I just, you know, continued to walk down that professional path until God interrupted my path, right? I mean, he like sovereignly stepped in, right? I had my plan, but he had his plans. I'd been trying to open these doors. None had opened. Then boom, he intervenes and opens it. I want to just encourage you all. Uh, so if, you know, whoever you are, you know, especially professionals, uh, you know, young people, you know, you're living life. You're like, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do? Uh, just, just rest in him. Just be still and know that he is God. He's going to lead you and guide you. Uh, like I said, I mean, we tried to open doors. None of them opened, but in the right time, he opened the door. We're able to go through. And especially for professionals, oh my goodness, how you can help us, help missionaries, help, you know, churches and organizations like ours by your, by your praying, by your giving, by your going. Uh, you know, again, God hasn't called all of us to go, you know, and, and that was something, again, it took a while for me and, and Andre to figure out that, you know, it's okay to stay here and support missions. As a matter of fact, I don't know if, if you've thought about this, but think about Jesus. He had those professionals and business people and, you know, that supported his ministry, right? I mean, Judas was a treasurer. They would, you know, people would give to his ministry. Paul was the same way, right? He had people that would give to his ministry. He was also a tent maker by vocational, but people gave to him. And uh, throughout history, God has raised up, especially business people, but other professionals to come along beside the work. Like for instance, William Tyndale. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, of course he is renowned for bringing the scriptures into the English language, right? So he translated them uh, from the uh, Latin to English. And, uh, but he had a businessman uh, who paid for all of his endeavors. So when he was evidently translating the scripture, this man came along beside him. They went to Germany together. Uh, there, that's where they got them printed in English, came back, bought, I think 3000 copies, brought them back to England. And of course he ended up being martyred for that, right? He was killed because, you know, at that point they didn't believe the scripture should be in any other language except for the Latin. Uh, so yeah, so, but he had this, and, and do you know that businessman was also martyred? Probably a lot of us don't realize that, but this man that basically supported his work in the background was martyred. And you find that over and over again. I know at A&M, you know, we have so many, uh, again, that, that support us out of their means, whatever they're doing. Again, God has gifted them to be, you know, again, business people or professionals or whatever they're doing. And we have doctors, lawyers, nurses, uh, you know, that again, they give to the mission, they pray, sometimes they go. And so Dan, it's very important. Be just, you know, just do what God has gifted you to do. And if he's, if he has a different calling, he's going to let you know. So I just want to encourage you with that. And again, young people as well, you know, if you're wondering, you know, man, what am I going to do? What am I going to be? Uh, just, you know, leave that to the Lord. Just pray to him, seek his word, you know, stay close to him. And then in the right time, he'll make it evident. Yes, sir. So basically, yeah. So really, um, so this book uh, was published uh, November last year. So almost a year ago. It's hard to believe. Uh, but I, you know, this story is funny. When I first joined A&M and uh, Brother Bo would take me to churches, I was shy to share my testimony because I thought it was somehow bringing glory to me and not God. And he, he, he let me know, hey, hey, brother. And he could actually tell my testimony better than I could for a long time. <laughs> so, but he said, brother, that's, that's God's testimony through you. So, you know, don't worry. Don't don't, don't take the credit. Don't take God's glory, right? So give him the glory. But um, so, you know, that's when I began to realize it was a little different, you know, than most others. And so really, though, last year, you know, really our, our uh, marketing director came to me and she said, you know, Oliver, it seems like, you know, maybe you should consider writing a book. And I had been thinking about this for a while. And, you know, I thought maybe it would happen. It wasn't something that was really burning deep inside. But at the same time, I thought if this 
would be a blessing to others, uh, then, you know, then I want to do it. And so, and so, yeah, so I really, then I, you know, I prayed about it and said, yes, now's the time. And so really that was kind of how it came about. And it really, it's basically my, the Lord's story through my life, uh, with lessons learned along the way. So some of the testimony that's in there, uh, you'll, you'll hear it, you'll read it again. Uh, but then it's, you know, number one is I pray it brings glory to God. Number two, I pray it encourages readers, especially those that start out like I did, right? I mean, all of us, a bunch of us, right? We start off on the kind of rough side of life, right? But it's, you know what? The Bible says it's not where you start the race, but it's where you finish. Amen. So we can finish strong. So no matter how we start, we can finish strong. And so, and then, yeah, and really the other part is just lessons learned. So. Yes, sir. Oh, well, it'd be worth $100, but, but it'd still only be $10. <laughs> but I would be happy to do that, Dan. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there's a book table out in the front. You Maybe you saw it when you came in. You know, I don't think, I, I, I didn't put a dish there or anything to, like, collect the checks or anything or, or cash or whatever you give. Uh, but you can just, you can give it to Dan or myself or, you know, leave it on the table out there, yeah, um, you know, if you decide to, to buy a copy. But, yes, and I'd be happy to sign you know, anybody's copy. Yes. Amen. So heavenly father, uh, Lord, what a, what a blessing God to, to, uh, know you, uh, through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, through his sinless life, his death, his resurrection. God, you have given us eternal life, abundant life on this earth and eternal life in heaven. God, we are so grateful. Father, you are such a good and kind and loving heavenly father. And Lord, uh, thank you for being that to us, Lord. And father, I do, I pray your blessing upon faith Baptist church family, Lord, upon my, my dearest brother and friend, Lord, uh, pastor Dan Riker, Lord, and Shelly and the elders the team here, Lord. Uh, Father, I just pray, God, that you would open up the windows of heaven. Thank you for the way you are already blessing them. Lord, just uh, the, the fruit that is just here, Lord, it's, it's a result of your Holy Spirit working in the lives of your people, Lord. I pray that that would just continue, Lord, that this people, they would just continue to keep their eyes on you, Lord, and uh, Lord, and just uh, giving you glory and praise, Lord, like they're doing, Lord. And Father, and again, just, just do the work of your Holy Spirit in every one of our hearts, Lord. And Father, even today, Lord, just uh, do what you want to do in and through our hearts, Lord, and, and Father, in our lives, God, and Father, again, uh, Lord, whatever you, whatever you've, uh, you've called us, Lord, to a higher calling, you've called us to, to go and to make disciples, Lord, and I pray, and I thank you, first of all, that Faith Baptist Church, Lord, they're doing it, they're already doing it, Lord, and, uh, but I just pray that you'd help them to do it even more, Lord, again, from here in Jerusalem to the uttermost parts, uh, Lord, your blessing, your love, your, your, everything you have, Lord, for, again, my, my dear friend, uh, Dan, Lord, and the church here, all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.